Okay, a hush came over the room. <laughs> I guess that means it's time to start. Uh, I apologize in advance for the popularity. Uh, so if, I appreciate I appreciate the fact that uh, some of you are, came even though there's no seats left. Um, and if there are any seats, please squeeze in. I don't see any actually open seats. Um, so again, I apologize for that. Uh, my name is Tim Bird. This is the status of embedded Linux uh, talk that I give on occasion. Um, and let's see if my clicker is going to work. Yep. So this is a talk that I give periodically. Um, it's not comprehensive. There's no way I can catch all of the things that are going on. Uh, so it's kind of stuff I'm interested in. If, if it doesn't, so hopefully it overlaps somewhat with things that you might be interested in. Um, and if, I, if you are doing like this really neat project and I completely missed it, I'm sorry about that. Uh, so I hope to accomplish two things with this. Uh, one, just to let people know what's going on, trying the general status, new things in the kernel, and open a discussion of what's next. Uh, feel free during the um, during during this session or after the session, you can get into the I think you can get into the session QA at, at, on the virtual platform even after the talk. So if you I have a question at the end of my slides, if you want to answer that question from your perspective or give me feedback. I'll, be on, I'll try to check the chat as we go through uh, their topic boards uh, on the Excel platform as well. So um, these were the historical areas of embedded Linux focus. Uh, and I think to some degree, we still kind of wrestle with these today. Uh, system size, boot time, power management. Um, and and we're, you know, we'll have new SOCs with us always. So we're always working on new drivers and new boards and arch support and stuff like that. <clears throat> so the, the major outline here is that I'm going to go through Linux technology, uh, the Linux kernel, and then through some technology areas, a little bit of industry news, uh, some, uh, some comments on the community, uh, trade associations and that type of thing, and some interesting use cases. This year, I've been kind of focused on space stuff uh, for various reasons. Um, and then some conclusions. So I don't have a lot of time. This is normally a talk that takes me about an hour and a half, uh, and nobody wants me to go that long. Uh, also, <laughs> I, 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 well, I took all this material out. So, uh, but uh, uh, the other thing about this is I, I really hope that uh, uh, the, the popularity, as indicated by the crowd, kind of matches the the goodness of the content. <laughs> but we'll see. Uh, so. Um, so, over, uh, the Linux kernel, let's just start there. <clears throat> so I'm going to go over versions in the last year. Uh, I'm going to pick a few items from each release um, that I think are relevant to embedded. So of course, there's lots of things in every release that are not relevant to embedded. Um, <clears throat> and uh, Drew, can I have you get me a water? Thanks. Um, so, and also, it's not very good coverage of uh, SOCs or uh, or driver contributions. Um, so that's, that's a bit of a shame because there's a lot of work in the embedded is there. Thank you very much. Oh, I'll try to use that when I need to. Um, and then some development stats and some company highlights. So let's look at kernel versions. Uh, I think John Corbett said uh, predicting when the next kernel come out, will come out is kind of like predicting when the sunrise and sunset are going to be. It's boring. Nobody looks at it. <laughs> Uh, because it's the same pretty much every time. So kernel is usually nine or ten weeks in terms of development cycle. We usually go through either seven or eight release candidates. And so this is, this is what the kernels have looked like in the last year. We're, we actually, this is a, uh, this is a rarity. Uh, we actually hit the merge window on Sunday. I had to update my slides because I didn't know if we were going to go to an RC8 or, or the merge window. So we're in the merge window for 6.5 right now. So. It's a little bit too early. I've been <laughs> busy with other stuff this week, so I actually don't know what's in the 6.5 kernel yet. Um, but uh, let's just go through some of these. <clears throat> Excuse me. Okay. <clears throat> so one of the first things in 5.19, so this is almost a year ago, uh, was support for 8.0 out. Uh, so now we're using ELF format executables, but 8.0 out. Uh, got removed from the kernel. This was actually deprecated earlier in 5.1. Uh, that's not huge news. I mean, I don't think uh, any of us are running 8.0 executables anymore. Uh, but it does show that stuff does uh, cycle out of the kernel. Um, so 
and I'll, I'll revisit that theme later, uh, the uh, e EROFS uh, read-only file system now uses FS cache, so it gives better performance on some systems. Uh, and if you were in the last session, you saw that it's already a pretty smoking hot file system for, for read-only data. Uh, so it might be even better now. Um, there's more packet drop annotations if you're using uh, networking, and I'll, I have a slide on that later, uh, so I'll come back to that. You can now embed a boot config file directly into the kernel image. I'll talk a little bit about that as well. Um, and there's initial support. I don't know how many people are using LoongArch CPU architecture. I think it's mostly being used in China, uh, but that <coughs> has been, that was the start of that happened with this kernel. So boot config, so what is boot config? Um, it turned out that for when you're trying to do boot time tracing, uh, you, if you, you, you need to pass a whole bunch of parameters, or you may want to pass a whole bunch of parameters into the kernel. Um, and so this is a new system that's allowed, that allows you to pass structured key value pairs as, as just simple text file into the kernel. And this can be attached to an EditRD image or embedded directly into the kernel image. And so when you're building for an embedded system, you want to trace some stuff going on at boot time, uh, you can pass a large number of tracing options. So you, you know, you, if you've used ftrace before, you, can know, you know it kind of can get a little chatty. Um, and so you can add your events, your filters, your actions, your probes, the fields that you want to do. And so it allows you to set up uh, kernel boot time tracing more easily. And if you're interested in that, go read the docs that are, that are upstream. Um, in Linux 6.0, okay, coming in October, uh, we had IOU ring supports zero copy network transmission. Uh, IOU ring is kind of the new shizzle uh, in, in the Linux kernel for fast uh, file system operations. I don't know how much people are using it embedded. It seems to be, uh, I mean, it's like when you're really, really concerned about file system performance, uh, you'll start doing some of this stuff. Um, but yeah, I mean, if you are interested in that, then this is something you want to look at. Uh, the KUnit tests now taint the kernel. So if you're running, uh, if you're running tests and you want to, <coughs> some of the KUnit tests can do some kind of <coughs> harsh things to the kernel, and you may want to know that later on. So you don't want to run KUnit tests in your like your production environment. So you can find out if that's happened. Um, there's a new thing called the runtime verification system. So this is uh, actually pretty important for uh, safety critical. Uh, it's just in its infancy this last year, uh, but I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about it later. Uh, the config Android option. Turned out that config Android as an option did not actually mean config Android. Uh, it turned, so people like Red Hat and Ubuntu were using it to signal other things. They were using some of the side effects of that config parameter to, to initiate other things. And so there was a long discussion, and eventually they just took, took it out and replaced it with something. I, I, I go read the lwn.net article, and you can see what the new thing is that replaces it. Uh, by the way, uh, this, is, this whole talk is basically a shameless ripoff of lwn.net. Uh, if you're not a paid subscriber, go, go pay them money. They do, they're the best in the business. I think the only in the business, uh, as far as I'm concerned, with all this stuff. Uh, uh, and then the print K. So if you're following real time, uh, you may know that there's this big print K refactoring going on. They're trying to do threaded print Ks uh, to make them more amenable to real time support. Um, developers have been trying to refactor that for a long time uh, for the RT support, but also for other reasons. Print K is uh, kind of long on the tooth. It's a little bit ugly. Uh, but unfortunately, uh, the refactoring didn't make it in this time. Uh, and it's still, it's still not finished. So it's, it's like, anyway, uh, back, back to the drawing board. Um, <clears throat> in 6.1, uh, BPF programs are supposed to be run in a sandbox and never be able to crash your system. Well, now they can. Uh, and uh, it, this is actually intended that uh, you can allow a BPF program to, to take the system down if it detects some kind of fault. And so BPF is starting to be used for all kinds of things. Of course, it's used for network filtering and, and stuff like that. That's its original purpose. It's been used a lot for tracing, and now it's being used. There's a lot of discussions about uh, security and how BPF can be involved in that. So you can do these runtime modules that get compiled on the fly, inserted into the kernel, run in a sandboxed environment, and and, uh, and do interesting things. Um, 
with, with your kernel at runtime. Uh, another big piece of news on this kernel in December was experimental support for Rust. Okay, so if you're, if you're one of those people that talks about Rust at cocktail parties, uh, <laughs> then, <laughs> like, like David, uh, then, <laughs> then this is very exciting to you. Um, uh, there's improved top-level uh, page support, and the kernel documentation just kind of continues to improve, which is really good. Um, and then support for multi-generational LRU. So again, if, if you're a scheduler fanatic, uh, there's, there's still, after all these years, I've been doing Linux for almost, uh, gosh, I think it might be 29 years now, and they're still coming up with new scheduler algorithms um, and, and page replacement algorithms. So um, this is a new system that kind of groups pages differently uh, into generations and, uh, and it improves performance under some workloads. Okay, now this one is where it gets interesting. In 6.2, the slob allocator was deprecated. So if you don't know what the slob allocator is, then uh, bless your heart, you, <laughs> you, missed, you missed an episode of Linux history, uh, but that's okay. Um, so this was introduced a long time ago as part of the config tiny patches, and uh, they're deprecating because nobody seems to be using it. Um, and again, I, I have a whole slide on this. Uh, uh, more Rust infrastructure code was added. There are improvements to SquashFS, and there's a new RV tool, uh, which is a runtime verification. So there's a tool now upstream that allows you to manage the models that are used for runtime verification. Um, and then 6.3, we're coming up to pretty recent kernels here. Um, lots of unused ARM boards were removed in this release, uh, like lots. Uh, so if you have a super old ARM board and you adopt a new kernel and find out that it's missing, uh, shame on you for not paying attention. You have, uh, but anyway, so stuff does leave the kernel. You can't just assume that if you're not up there maintaining it, helping out, that it's gonna stay around forever. Um, the kernel can now be configured. Is, is Geert in here? Yeah, the kernel can now be configured with a built-in dry stone test. Thank you <laughs> for, uh, for that. So, that, that's really interesting. I mean, we're seeing a lot of more tests that are upstream in the kernel source tree, KUnit and KSelf test. Uh, but this one is like embedded in, is, is it in the KSelf test tree? Or is it, it just somewhere else? Okay. Uh, anyway, so this is something you can run, you do some performance benchmarks. You don't have to rely on BOGO MIPS anymore, uh, which is, a, is exactly what it, it sounds like. It's a, it's a bogus measure of performance. Um, <laughs> Uh, the make v equals zero option was removed. Okay, so um, there's been a, a trend. I think, it, I don't know if it's on this page or the next one. Uh, no, anyway, there's a trend uh, to make kernel much more chatty with uh, warnings and debug messages. And so uh, I think you're not allowed to turn off the messages. So. Uh, if you're a kernel developer and you have and you've written some code that causes the kernel to issue the compiler to issue warnings, uh, you have to now go fix them uh, uh, because Linus wants a, a clean build, uh, and it's taken a long time to get to the point where that's the case, where the, you know there's so few warnings that it's just not a bunch of noise that people ignore. Uh, but that's an important attribute uh, for upstream. Um, there was a minor change to developer certificate of origin, and actually I'm going to circle back to that later, so I'm going to not explain that. Okay, in Linux 6.4, the slob at memory allocator was actually removed, okay? Uh, so there's some nice documentation that was just added for building the kernel. Uh, so if you're kind of a newbie, uh, the kernel documentation continues to get filled out. Um, oh, there's this whole kerfluffle about uh, module license declarations. Uh, so, uh, the idea was that uh, some things, uh, someone wanted to analyze whether or not uh, thing, what things in the kernel could be built as modules, and so they were declaring, they were using this module license, if that happened to be in some of the source code, they were using that as an indicator, well this can be a module. Well it turns out that this was used in all kinds of situations where it couldn't still be a module, uh, and so there was a lot of discussion about that. It, was, it was, had kind of been misused over the years, so that's been cleaned up. And then uh, user trace events, uh, API fixes has been merged. Okay, so that's, that's, that's the end of my kernel thing. I did that super quick. Um, I don't know how I'm doing on time. Okay, so Loom Arch, I just want to talk about this a little bit. 
I don't think very many people are using this in embedded. Maybe they are. Uh, I don't know very much about it, but it's a processor architecture designed by a ch Chinese company called Lungsan. Uh, the architecture was uh, started in 2002, so it's not like brand new. Uh, it's a variant of MIPS, but recently it kind of went through an overhaul, um, and it incorporates ideas from both MIPS and RISC-V. Uh, it's not binary compatible with either, but uh, so it supports kind of the standard things you'd expect, 32-bit uh, reduced instruction set, so that might be applicable to embedded, a 32-bit standard size instruction set, and 64-bit instruction set. And it seems to be, the interesting thing here, it seems to be a processor uh, architecture that was designed with Linux in mind as its, as its kind of primary uh, host OS, right? Uh, which is different than, you know, a lot of other systems have been designed with other operating systems in mind. Um, anyway, so if you're interested in that, uh, there's, there's a link you can go learn about it. Okay, so I got the developer stats for 6.3. Again, shamelessly ripped off from LWN.net. Um, this is kind of what people are working on, uh, and it, it's very characteristic. So if you see, there's about, every kernel release, there's about 2,000 developers that are involved. Um, and when you think about the size of the code base and the, the amount of activity, that's actually not that big of a number. I mean, there are, there are companies, well, I, my own company, I, I work for Sony, we have uh, at least 2,000 developers uh, working on the Linux kernel, and not, that, not, not all of them are working upstream. So, I mean, there, so, and the interesting thing about this is the 250 new developers. So every release, and this is a pretty standard um, stat that, uh, every release, there's about 250 people to show up who have never, or at least we don't have records enough to identify, who have never contributed a patch before. So if you, if you thought, oh, well, you know, you have to be, you know, you have to have been working on the kernel for 10 or 15 years if you want to be a kernel developer. That's not true at all, okay? There's still an opportunity. You see a problem in the kernel, uh, raise it on the mailing list, go out, and you, you too can be a kernel developer. Um, so this is some of the most active developers by change sets. Uh, Christoph Kozlowski, uh, he's with Lenaro doing device tree updates. You see a lot of Lenaro people. Uh, Arn Bergman makes the list for removing code. Um, and, uh, and then you can see some of that. Christoph Helwig always shows up for some reason or another. Well, we know why he shows up, because he's in the block file system. He refactors code. He's, he's like um, a mega janitor in the kernel. Um, and uh, he touches a lot of stuff. Uh, this is uh, same stats, but by lines of code changed. Uh, again, Arn Bergman with uh, removal of old, old code. Uh, Qualcomm uh, added a, a Wi-Fi driver. Uh, Greg Craw Hartman did lots of driver work, but he also removed some stuff from staging. Hans Verquill removed old media drivers. And Kai Ho King. I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. We removed lots of DRM drivers. So the interesting stat on this kernel was four out of five developers uh, were made the top top five list uh, because they were removing code from the kernel. Okay, so that should tell you something about the churn that's going on upstream. Uh, we are trying to keep the thing kind of sane and, and maintainable. Uh, in terms of commit log entries, so these are not the same numbers that you saw on the previous pages because I use, I have my own tools. In fact, those are the tools I'm using, just git log, and I have my own thing called author stats. Um, but the kernel commits, it's about the same every time. And when you think about it, it's absolutely mind boggling that this pace of development has, has been consistently like this, seriously, for like uh, five, 10 years, uh, 16,000 patches uh, going in in a seven week period, seven to nine weeks. Um, and that's, I mean, obviously the patches are being developed out of that window, uh, the commit window, but uh, still, and, and like I said, consistently about 2,000 developers. Um, so here's your most active organizations uh, by the area of the kernel they work in. Uh, the core kernel, you have kind of the usual suspects, Google, Intel, uh, Red Hat, Meta, Oracle. Uh, in architecture, no surprise, Lenaro shows up and uh, IBM and Intel. Uh, with drivers, a lot of the, lot of the reasons that the drivers, that, like Intel, AMD, have, have large driver stats is because of GPU code, tends to be pretty verbose. Uh, file, but people working on file system and block layer, uh, networking, 
And you'll see you know, kind of the same people everywhere. Uh, we could use more help in documentation. I know uh, John Corbett just recently raised that on the Case Summit Discuss list. Uh, if you have, if, if that's, that's a great place to start. If you want to get involved with kernel upstream development, uh, don't know if your C, C uh, chops are good enough, uh, go, go work on some documentation. There's always stuff there, low-hanging fruit, and uh, the work is very much appreciated. Uh, this is, this is, I focused in on embedded companies. I apologize if your company's not listed here. And again, this is work, this is contributions to the kernel. So j if you see a low number there, it doesn't mean that that company is slacking off. Usually it means they're up doing stuff in user space. Uh, but these are some of the major companies that are, and then I looked at who the top contributor was from each of those companies and the types of things they're working on. And you see it, it's kind of all over the map. So you have, uh, Bailey Ray, uh, Quarantine was doing a lot of work on Rockchip and crypto libraries or the crypto subsystem. Uh, Miguel Rinal was doing uh, network and NVM, MVMEM stuff. Um, and uh, just down the list, I'm not gonna read through all these. Uh, but you can kind of see what's happening in terms of the, the kernel and, and uh, what companies are, are contributing upstream. Uh, okay, so that was the kernel. That was my focus on the kernel. Let's switch over to technology areas, and I just want to go through uh, a couple real fast. Um, so I talked about, yeah, fast, faster than I have been. Um, so I talked about Loon Arch support already. A bunch of ARM boards have been removed. Uh, there's been proposed removal for Super H and Itanium. I don't know if anybody in here cares about Itanium, but you, there are, I know that there are some companies that may, might be concerned about Super H going away. So if you are, uh, you need to step up and, and uh, t you know, get, a, get on the mailing list. I know in Embedded, we're often three to five years behind the times with our kernels on our products, uh, but try to pay attention to make sure your architecture doesn't get removed. So I don't think, I don't think ARM's gonna get removed or Intel's gonna get removed, but you know, be, just be watching the mailing list, keep on top of stuff. The, the big discussion that happens when these uh, architectures are considered for removal is, well, is that someone willing to maintain it? Is anyone, you know, what, obviously, uh, we're not gonna try, the upstream is not gonna try to remove stuff if it's known that there's a lot of users. Uh, but we can't tell if there's users if there's no developers, if there's no activity on the mailing list. Um, and uh, so, yeah, if you, if you want something to continu continue to be maintained upstream, uh, you need to be involved uh, with the upstream, you know, message forums and mailing lists and stuff like that. In terms of bootloaders, okay, this is a really neat feature. Uh, so U-Boot now supports the ability to load images over HTTP, okay, which uh, previously it supported uh, the UDP protocol and you could use uh, NFS or TFTP s servers, uh, but now it's got like, I guess it's got an HTTP stack in there. Um, and actually I had, an, this actually caused an idea to, I'll, I'll have to talk to the UV people offline. Um, but you can now download your kernel uh, from a web server. Uh, so that, and a web server is pretty easy to set up these days, especially like a local web server. You know, you can just have a development one on your, on your host system. Um, and then Snagboot, which I'm gonna talk about. So Snagboot is a set of tools that can help boot and install images on uh, boards that fail to boot. So this is uh, something that Bootlin produced and it's open source, uh, consists of two, two utilities, snag recover to initialize memory and run the bootloader, and then snag flash, which will communicate uh, with the system to put a new working system image on. So what this addresses is that uh, for a lot of development boards, there are kind of custom proprietary tools that you have to use to recover those boards, and uh, sometimes, sometimes they don't work. Um, but uh, this, this looks like a really nice system. Um, I, ha I have to be honest, I haven't run it myself, but, uh, but I read about it and uh, there you go. Um, the, the core kernel, okay, so something, uh, if, you, if you thought they were done working on core aspects of the kernel like fork and exec, uh, you were wrong. Uh, because they're even in the last uh, little bit here, I think this was about uh, three months ago, um, I think Josh Triplett did some work on IOU ring spawn. So IOU ring is the new way to have accelerated 
uh, operations performed in the kernel without having to go through system calls. You can queue up a bunch of operations in a ring buffer uh, that then the kernel can do without having to go through the syscall boundary multiple times. And they said, well, if we're doing it for reads and writes, how about if we did it for, for forks and execs? And so it's actually more efficient than traditional user space based fork and exec. Um, and part of the reason for that is that uh, fork and exec, if you know, uh, understand how they work, they're discarding a lot of pages as, as you go through the copy on write to load the new exec image in. Um, and so you can now transfer control to a new program all inside the kernel without interaction through user space. And it's uh, 60, 6 to 10% faster than vFork and 30 plus percent faster than POSIX spawn. Okay, so, uh, you know, what will the kernel developers think of next? Uh, <laughs> they, they just keep optimizing stuff. Uh, in terms of file systems and I.O., some work on MTD, SPI, NOR, uh, enhanced locking to support reads while writing. Uh, I talked about the uh, EROFS enhancements. Lots of tweaks to files, existing file systems and drivers. Every, every release, there's a, a bunch of tweaks where, um, you know, some like F2FS supports some new IOCTL that I didn't even know existed. Uh, stuff like that. <laughs> but uh, uh, not much that I could see that was specific to embedded. Okay, now I'm going to go through uh, languages. So MicroPython, a lot of people are using MicroPython in their projects. It just had a version release in April. Um, and it's got a new package manager. Uh, reduced code size, uh, support for some new boards, support for Zephyr, and support for WASM. Okay, so uh, I don't know if that's how you're supposed to say that, by the way. Um, but WASM WebAssembly is, uh, allows you to take programs uh, and run them in a browser. So you can compile down to this bytecode that runs, and so you can run Python apps in a browser now. Uh, so maybe we can get rid of that Java thing. Uh, anyway, that's, sorry. Um, Python 3.11.3 was released in April. 3.11 in general uh, is, its big claim to fame is uh, it's faster. It's about 1.22 times the speed up on a standard benchmark. Claims to be 10 to 60% faster than Python 3. And it's got some other stuff uh, going on, so you can check that out. Oh, I thought this was interesting. So, uh, I, the, the title of the article I stumbled across was, yeah, developer creates self-hilding programs that fix themselves, uh, which is a little bit of a stretch, but not, not too much. So there's a project called Wolverine that will run your Python program. Uh, if it sees an exception and a traceback, it will analyze the problem uh, using, chat GP, using GT, GPT-4. It will go out, it will construct a patch, it will apply the patch, it will rerun the program. <laughs> and it will continue to do this in, in a loop until your program has no more uh, exceptions. Okay, so how useful that is, it's hard to say, but it, you know, AI, the AI, you know, I for one welcome our new AI overlords. Um, so that's, that's, I thought that was interesting. So we, we're hoping they don't do the same for kernel programs, uh, drivers. Um, so Rust support continues to go into the main line. We still do not have what I would call a real driver, um, but Rust is using, being used more and more throughout the industry. In fact, there's a whole operating system, CAT OS. Um, and uh, 1.71 will likely support the Musil C library, uh, and I'm gonna have to go faster. Okay, so there's a new function. If you're doing networking, uh, there's a new function to provide the reason for a packet drop. It's called KFree SDK Reason. It used to be just called KFree SDK. Um, and so now in the kernel, you can instrument uh, the reason that a packet was dropped. So that's actually pretty handy. Gives better diagnostics for what's going on when your network is acting up. Um, real time, everybody wants to know about the status of real time. So sleeping spin locks were mainlined in 5.16. The patches have been going in continuously. Uh, but it stalled a little bit. I think it actually last year it kind of hit the the low point of out of tree patches with about 1,300 lines of code. Uh, this year it's back up to about 3,100 lines of code. But that's a very small amount. Okay, it's really easy to apply the the real time patches. And in fact, I have a script that does it. Um, and so uh, some of the changes that are outstanding are a print K 8250 serial driver. And actually in the in the summit this morning. Uh, or not in Monday morning, 
Uh, I was talking to Thomas, and he says those are actually kind of the same thing. The reason that PrintK has problems with real time is when it's talking to the serial console. Um, and so some other, some other areas, we're expecting any time. I think I read somewhere, maybe on lwn.net, that maybe 6.5 is when we'll get the, the last patch in the series that will allow you to enable it in a vanilla uh, you know, kernel. Uh, but we'll see. I, I think it'll take a little bit longer to get PrintK refactored than people thought. Uh, so, so that's the status of real time. Um, again, it's not that hard to apply the patches, and, and preempt RT is working really well. Kernel hardening uh, continues in the area of security. Uh, BF, BPF raises some interesting security issues when you're trying to, they, they want to do something called authoritative LSM hooks, and that was kind of shut down, that was rejected. Um, and, and there's been some discussion about allowing unprivileged users to run BPF modules. Allow, allowing an unprivileged user to inject code into the running kernel, what could go wrong? Uh, <laughs> Okay, and I got a comment on this. I think, okay, I, I'm okay with you taking the slob memory allocator out of the upstream kernel, uh, but it, you didn't give it enough deprecation time, in my opinion. Uh, so not enough people kind of showed up on the list. They announced in 6.2 they were gonna do it, uh, but it was only like five months between deprecation and like it's gone. And so if you're using uh, the SLOB allocator, I'm very sorry, it's gone now. Uh, and don't move to slab uh, because they're, they have their eyes on that one. Uh, uh, but you're, so there is a new option, config tiny, con slib, config slub tiny. So the new allocator you're supposed to be using is slub, S-L-U-B. Oh, and this is not brand new news at all. This is actually, what, eight years, nine years old news or something, I don't know. Uh, there's a tool called Bloaty McBloatface uh, that I stumbled across by Google. Uh, to analyze the size of ELF binaries. And it turns out it does a really, really good job. I mean, it goes into the structures and can give you a, a comparison between two binaries. So you change some config options and recompile, you can see exactly what it does to the, all the different sections, the, the BSS, the data, everything. Um, and uh, so it's open source a long time ago, but I just thought I'd throw it in. Um, oh, but in the area of Tiny, uh, so there's this weird thing going on where uh, I think it was Paul McKinney wanted to write some, uh, some, program, some test programs. He wanted to be as small as possible. So they started developing this system where they're using some macros to replace the C library. Uh, and this was originally created for kernel testing. It's basically just a set of .h files, uh, which create macros again. And you, it creates really, really small binaries depending on what you call. Right, because it's, so I did my own little test, hello world test, and hello using libc was uh, only 1159 bytes, but then, you know, it depends on a, like a two megabyte C library. Hello no libc, with no dependencies on any C libraries whatsoever, was actually smaller. So you had a, a binary that had no dependency on, C li, on libc that was smaller than the other one. Uh, though, I don't know if this is useful for embedded. If you're doing super, super hardcore, low memory embedded, this might be something you want to look at. It's, it's not intended to, you know, you're not going to be able to compile Chrome or something <laughs> using, using kernel macros to replace libc. But for something, I, I, one of the things I wanted to test I didn't have time was to see if HTTP D, D Lite or something would, would compile, and that would be interesting. Okay. Because I'm getting low on time, I'm gonna skip the testing stuff. Uh, LTP had a new test suite. Uh, tool chains keep getting released. Uh, let's see. I, these slides will be upstream. Uh, LLVM had another release and it's being used a lot more. Uh, oh, you can submit patches to the kernel without having to be on the mailing list. It's not recommended. You should be there to answer questions but you don't actually have to submit through the mailing list. That's been, a, that's been a stumbling block, especially for people who are in companies that have exchange servers and weird VPNs. And, uh, Sony mangles all the mail that goes out uh, from, from my system, so I usually have to submit patches outside of Sony's mail system. And so the tools like B4 are, are really interesting. Uh, there's something always going on with tr perf. Okay, Yocto project. So BMW joined the Yocto project. That's pretty cool. They just had a release, the Mickledore release, um, and uh, improved memory and disk usage, improved parsing time, uh, and so uh, that's good stuff. 
Uh, com kernel community. Okay, this was funny. I just had to throw this one in. So Cur Linus, uh, for a couple of years now, has had a set of scripts that detect when he's got certain words in his emails and, and will prevent them from going out. And so and Linus now no longer uses those words. But every once in a while, when he quotes an email from someone else, they have one of those words. So he has kindly asked that other developers, please do not call each other morons on the list. Uh, so there you see a, it's a knock-on effect from uh, Linus improving his behavior. Now, now other people have to improve it as well. There was a very slight change to the DCO. OK, so let me get to industry news. Um, some of these I can go through real quick. SFC sues Microsoft over GitHub Copilot. Uh, if you're using GitHub, if you're using Copilot, I would talk to your, the lawyers at your company uh, about that. Um, well, at least the lawyers at my company were very interested. Uh, well, let me let me talk about this. So this is similar in spirit. So there's all these lawsuits now about AI and what the training data sets are and are they using it in a in a copyright friendly or copyright uh, compatible fashion. Um, and I think this uh, stuff is all going to take, it's going to take a while to go through the courts, but it, it does need to get resolved. And I think the SFC, my personal opinion off the record, not speaking on behalf of Sony, but my personal opinion is I think the SFC had a point here that, you know, that when you're reproducing verbatim code and it's GPL code and, and you're not providing, you know, the license or the source code, okay, that's a problem. Um, uh, Intel and ARM have this agreement uh, to do designs on using Intel's 18A process. By the way, that A stands for angstrom. Yes, we're talking about sub-nanometer processors. Uh, that is kind of mind-blowing. Um, oh, NASA and RISC-V. Uh, so NASA has selected uh, microchip to design and produce a 12-core RISC-V. So uh, they're doing a new high NASA does these types of things. They designed a new processor specifically for space applications, um, designed for high performance, but fault tolerance in the face of radiation, that type of thing. Uh, but it's interesting because they may, this stuff may be amenable to be used for uh, other areas that need fault tolerance, right? So if you harden it for radiation, you can harden it for other fault tolerance situations. Um, so Leonard, Leonard Pottering is now working for Microsoft. Uh, make of that what you will. Um, OK, I, I, I'm running out of time. I'm just going to go with satellites because uh, I've been studying space this year. So L Linux is used in a lot of satellites. Uh, I, was, I was shocked at how many. Uh, it's uh, estimated that about 50% of CubeSats are running Linux as some part of the flight stack. You have major constellations like Starlink and Planet that are using Linux. So each Starlink satellite has over 60 processors, and they're all running Linux. And they're using you have once you get into space, it's like a whole different world. Well, no pun intended. Uh, <laughs> uh, um, but they they're using voting algorithms and fault tolerance algorithms that are really interesting. Uh, redundant failover. Uh, as of uh, June 2023, last last time I counted, 4,600 Starlink satellites in orbit. Um, and so you can do the math. There's a lot of Linux up in space. Um, and of course, you can't talk about Linux in space without mentioning the Mars helicopter. Totally cool. Uh, this, this little, little uh, I think, four kilogram uh, robot helicopter has been flying on, uh, on Mars. Uh, it's performed 51 flights. It was originally only intended to do uh, five, uh, but they've they now have, they added support for autonomous landing site selection. So uh, there was an issue. They used to be out on this flat crater floor, but now they're flying up canyons and stuff. And so it actually picks its landing site automatically. Uh, the guys at NASA are geniuses. Um, and so there was recently concern. Uh, it, they're now kind of playing hide and seek with it. Now that they're in some rougher terrain, uh, they lost radio contact because of terrain features and distance to the rover, and it's very, very dicey. So I don't know how much longer. The fact they're using a Qualcomm off-the-shelf COTS processor, and the thing goes down to like negative 80 Celsius every night. You're going, how long can this thing last? I mean, if I put my phone in the freezer every night, I don't think it would last two years. But uh, it's absolutely amazing. Um, and you can see its path, and there's a lot of resources you can go to look up that. So. Uh, 
Just a really, just super quickly, uh, we lost uh, a, a prominent member of our community this last year, Wolfgang Dank, uh, the pro probably most famous for his knowledge uh, for the creation of U-Boot. Uh, I think we've all been touched by his code in some way or another. He's a true champion of open source, um, and he will be missed. I'm going to skip over the conference stuff. I'll talk about conferences uh, when we get to, uh, during the closing game, if you hang around that long, or you can look in the slides. Uh, Eland Quiki is losing its, uh, lo losing its funding. That's another thing that's kind of sad. Um, okay, I, I knew I was going to run out of time. Uh, but it's just lunchtime, right? So, uh. <laughs> uh, oh, here, just a quick list of the Linux Foundation projects that are doing different things in different areas of embedded. So, we've got Eliza uh, or Elisa doing safety and certification. The core infrastructure pat, uh, project is handling. Uh, support longevity, up to 10 years support for kernels, automotive grade Linux, drone code. Um, oh, and I don't even have time to talk about all of them. Uh, so conclusions, we're doing great. Um, <laughs> if, if, you know of some, if you know an area where we're not doing great, come talk to me, okay? Because I want to hear about it. I want to hear areas where we could improve, and uh, either in the development space or in the technology space. Uh, so leave me a note, contact me online, or send me an email, um, and we'll try to make things even better in the future. Uh, thanks very much, and go have lunch and have fun. Thank you.